Domo greetings. Uh, my name is Rahula and I'm one of Bante Chandana's students. And just before you get to listen to one of his amazing discourses, um, I just wanted to share with you that Bante is a, a wandering monk. So he has no home and he purely relies on donations um, of dana by followers and by the community to survive just for the bare essentials. So if you feel of value, please feel free to share after the video and enjoy. Thank you. The Dhamma is not and cannot be proprietary. No one can own the Dhamma. But we live in a world that, where we find ourselves constantly witnessing characters popping from everywhere. Um, claiming some type of uh, expertise, even though they don't even know what type of expertise People open their mouths and release uh, a barrage of words and usually it's full of contention, of course. Um, they don't even have any clue what they're really saying. People are parroting. But the underlying phenomenon, underlying common denominator, if you will, is that of standing out, that of seeking attention. You saw this, um, you see this in, the, in, in Lord Buddha's contemporaries, where you had individuals who, such as uh, one particular uh, teacher comes to mind, uh, Sanjaya, and he, he was the teacher of uh, who used to be um, Kolite and Upatissa, who, who later on became the chief disciples, uh, Venerable Mahamuggalana and Venerable Sariputta, chief disciples to Lord Buddha. But Sanjaya, even though he knew that he was shallow, he was empty, he didn't have anything per se that could be considered to be living the holy life and attaining something because his students were empty, were lacking, did not have um, what can be termed as true spiritual worth at least for themselves. The training was not there. Training as in capital T. Same thing as you see today. So when Upatissa found uh, Venerable Asaji, who shared with him a portion of a verse, <laughs> he became a Sotapanna, a noble disciple, first stage, a stream winner. He quickly rushed to go and find his close friend, Kolita, who later on became, as I mentioned, Venerable Mahamu Gallana. And he shared with them that verse a little bit longer, the whole complete uh, verse. And Venerable, uh, well, uh, Kolita, he also became a Sotapanna. He also became a stream winner. And they both rushed to go to their teacher before they rushed to go join Lord Buddha and accept him as their teacher, obviously, because... What he had, Venerable Asaji had relayed, had conveyed in his own words, statements. That was not even the words of Lord Buddha, the verse. It was something that was impromptu, done, right there because Upatissa had been urging, because he was so taken by the demeanor of Lord Buddha's disciple, Venerable Asaji. He was one of the original five disciples, by the way, for those who don't know. 
So he was moved and he urged, he asked, he begged Venerable Asaji to tell him who his teacher is and, and what does he teach. And Venerable Asaji said, well, I, I've recently uh, become a bhikkhu, but my teacher's teaching is so vast and I, I don't find myself qualified to um, elaborate on and do a good job. So uh, when he kept on urging, uh, Venerable Asaji said, well, this is my teacher's message. All that comes to be, all that is conditioned, is also destined to come apart. Of course, I'm paraphrasing here. But basically, they rushed. Before they went to Lord Buddha, they rushed back to Sanjaya because they felt like he actually gave them something. He he was helping them. And he said, uh, no, I'm fine where I am because uh, I'm enjoying this world of mediocrity because I am, you know, not every student is going to be like you both. There's a lot of basically idiots. There's a lot of mediocre students. There's a lot of shallow minds and hearts who are satisfied with just enough that's what we have today. Just enough. And when you have the internet, when you have... Uh, well, the person doesn't even have to leave their home, their house, their phone. I remember when I used to go from bookstore to bookstore, library to library, from one temple, one center to the next, drive from one place to the next. I used to get on a plane fly, switch planes to get to a destination so I could go and meet a teacher uh, about whom I had read somewhere, something being mentioned, and I was moved and I was thinking maybe he might have the answer. He might. So I was all over the place. So, And that was still luxury compared to what, as I was mentioning, with uh, Venerable... Sariputta and that generation of seekers who would walk for hundreds and hundreds of miles. So you don't have that. So that extra energy which could uh, really test a person to make him think twice, basically, isn't there today. So you don't have to invest anything, pretty much. You just have to do a few clicks with your cursor on your computer, and you're reading a few things, and you read another thing, and usually <clears throat> you're going to jump on a YouTube channel, and then and maybe, maybe, maybe put those 15 minutes to watch a 15-minute video, a Dhamma talk, if it is a true Dhamma talk, based on the suttas, Otherwise, it's mostly somebody's opinions about something that was said. So what you have today, uh, mediocrity, even within the Sangha circles, even within the Dhamma circles. When I was uh, teaching, um, I, I really had to resist my teacher back in the 90s, when he insisted that I, and he was a venerable, uh, in the Mahatera, actually, he was the chief <laughs> Mahatera, uh, uh, from the Theravada tradition, Mahatera means, uh, you know, elder bhikkhu. He was in his late 70s, uh, and he urged me, I put up a fight, I did not find myself qualified to teach. And he had been teaching me for a while, and and then finally he said uh, he er, you know he he wasn't going to get a no for an answer, so he pushed me, and I said, okay, Bante, I will. But today it's 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 like the opposite. I mean, isn't there other, aren't there other fields where people could go and and become teachers at? Well. When you think about it, when you look at it logistically, you see that it doesn't take much 
to become a teacher. At least in their minds. So you have what I'm saying, what I'm try, uh, driving at is you have a lot of the blind leading the blind. Now, if it was just that, you know, who cares, right? But the problem is many people have been going and ordaining for two weeks, <laughs> sometimes two years, sometimes even ten years. And then disrobing and starting their own version of the Dhamma, either in robes or when once they've disrobed their own version. And usually it comes with a set of complaints, a set of um, revolution. They are revolutionizing. They are uh, being more uh, true to the Dhamma by presenting their own version. Now, every time we speak, we say something, it always will be none other than our version of the truth, the truth that is based on our experience. This is when we're talking about uh, individuals who are honest and, and really living uh, existentially, presently, in the moment, and being truthful because they have some values, values that are universal for everyone. Okay? That's like the caveat. But, oftentimes, unfortunately, you're seeing people's ulterior motives coming into the picture. Now, usually it comes either through the lack of information, as I was mentioning in the beginning, uh, pretending to have the information, pretending, pretending to have the pedigree, pretending to have the training, pretending to have the academic, conceptual, theoretical, if you will, understanding augmented by the experiential, the training, the practice which doesn't happen over three months, which doesn't happen over a few years even, not even ten years. So what you have is a mumbo-jumbo. It's, it's a mixture of things. But because there is no, like, uh, there cannot be, because we don't have, the only authority can be, in my opinion, uh, as, as an external person, um, would only be the Buddha, Lord Buddha himself, as the officiating body, if you will, the one who can give a confirmation as to what is and what is not. But Lord Buddha also helped us with that before he closed his eyes for the last time, because he said, ultimately, it's the Dhamma and Vinaya that will guide you, not even I. He was basically saying, I was merely a servant of the Dhamma. Hence, the Dhamma itself did not even become proprietary to Lord Buddha himself. But we're living in a time period where everybody wants to make their own version of the Dhamma. Look at the audacity. I've known several monks, monks, who had turned the Dhamma that they had studied, or believed that they were practicing even, into their own uh, version. For years I struggled with that, even while I was a student of theirs. Plural. Ultimately, though, one has to have the audacity, the capacity, the honesty, the humility to go back to the suttas. And there, the words of Lord Buddha are so present. Fortunately, we have that. So we don't have to have the situation where it's the blind leading the blind. Again, this comes back to misinformation or the lack in information, the lack in doing one's own research. The material is there. I don't care um, what type of a uh, less than perfect type of a translation, because there's a lot of translations today and um, of the suttas, uh, any one of them c 
can be a guide. To help a person to see um, what is what, what is Dhamma from what is Adhamma. So this is something that um, is a major problem. I've been addressing this issue in many of its facets during the last several years. Why? Because I still, on a daily basis almost, I get emails from individuals asking me, for help, for clarification, for um, support, for, um, well, to teach them, etc., uh, or to, you know, clarify for them or for the masses, etc., etc. I'm only one person. Meanwhile, the Dhamma is there. It's available. Um, and that's what I've been dedicating myself, my work, my life to do to bring up the suttas, to reintroduce the suttas, and to retranslate the suttas in a, in, in a way where it is intelligible. It's not, you know, it's not scholarly language, unreachable, non-contextual, completely, almost uh, um, dead, I would consider, uh, lifeless, colorless uh, translations. Um, Very left-brained translations, and being a right-brain primarily uh, type of a person, I've always struggled with that. And, but anyhow, um, I don't have to go over m the last forty years of my life uh, in it, in the Dhamma, studying it as a student. I still am a student. I will die a student of the Dhamma. I know that, but. Um, One needs to be very cognizant of the uh, threatening presence of this um, ignorance, which is very much uh, uh, drenched in arrogance. Because what you have are individuals who are claiming to be even noble disciples. Noble Disciples as one of the four stages of awakening. As I mentioned in the beginning uh, about uh, Upatissa and Kolita, who later became uh, Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Mahamogallana, they had stay, uh, attained to the first stage. Now there's the other three stages. Once returner, non-returner, and arahant, the fourth, which is complete, completely awakened. So you have today the lexicon of awakening from the Theravadan tradition. This has happened in the last 10 or 12 years or so, I've noticed. People did not talk about this 30 years ago. People did not even mention the jhanas 15 years ago, like openly. I remember teachers would shun it, they would discourage us, they would say... Um, you know, things that are, uh, if anything is, is, is not vipassana, it's not insight, then it is less than. I remember that was happening in my life, so I really had to struggle. Then what did I do? One has to have the courage, as I said, the audacity to go back to the suttas. The teachings of Lord Buddha are alive. So before one opens their mouth, I don't care if they are in robes or in lay clothing. By the way, you cannot practice as a layman, as a laywoman, fully and really attain any of the fruits, any of the, the three fruits, the three levels of awakening, without being an upasaka or upasika. That means you have to take at least the five precepts daily. That means you must take the three refuges. Must. So you cannot be practicing as a, as a member of a different religion. Okay? Let me just say that as well. Because some people have been advertising themselves and 
selling themselves, the image uh, to the selling to the public, the image that they are uh, also awakened and they happen to be of a different religion. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's impossible. Unless that path has within it the eightfold path. I still have not come across any religion, unless it is an offshoot or somebody's... Again, that doesn't last too long. Somebody tried to copy. There's been religions or quasi-pseudo-religions here and there, or cults, that have been trying to use the Dhamma to reinterpret, to repackage, and that's what's happening today. Individuals who are putting different things together in order for them to create something. Meanwhile, it is, when you look at it, the bottom line, the litmus test, has to be those two things that Lord Buddha talked about, that I mentioned earlier, the Dhamma and Vinaya. What are these? The Dhamma, in essence, uh, is comprised of the five Nikayas, the five collections of discourses. Okay? So they're basically the discourses, the suttas. We call them the suttas. Or in the case of the Theragata and Terigata, the verses of the elder bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. So that goes in the Kuddhakanikaya, which is the shorter, uh, the collection of shorter discourses. In it we find the Dhammapada, in it we find the Udana, in it Vuttaka, in it we find the Suttanipata, in addition to the Theragata and Terigata. Right? So, I think I, uh, if, my, if I forgot, uh, you know, one. But basically, those are the essential. Next, you get to the... I'm not doing them in order, because they're not necessarily in order. Uh, although some might argue with that. But um, there's the Diganikai, which are the longer discourses. Longer discourses, extended discourses. And then you have the Majjimanikaya that are middle length discourses. Okay? So, um, oh, by the way, the Diganikaya, the long discourses, go to uh, 34 suttas. Um, the Majjimanikaya are 152. Then you go to the big, really big collections. The Sangyutta Nikaya, that is over 5,000, if not more, probably seven, I think, uh, if not more. Um, and then you get to the Anguttara Nikaya, that are the numerical discourse. Sangutta, by the way, are the connected discourses. Okay? So the Anguttara Nikaya, Anga means by a factor of one, gradual. So um, that one goes anywhere from seven to eleven thousand to you know ten thousand. That's the one that I have been tackling for the last three, four years, actually five almost. Um, I started by narrating it, but uh, from whatever was available suttas, and I always was finding myself having to change some things even during the narration because there's so many terms that are. Not correct. Not correct. Um, I can say that, not because of hearsay, but because there needs to be these two things, as I was mentioning. One has to have the academic, theoretical, conceptual uh, book knowledge, learning of those languages, and then two, one has to be the practitioner of these principles of the training, patipada. Those two are like the two wings of a bird. So what you have in the world, even if a person is a very good practitioner, they need to have it be augmented by the understanding. Lord Buddha, as I was mentioning, I'm, I'm working on the Anguttara, right? The numerical. So many suttas I come across and have come across where Lord Buddha goes again and again and again back to the importance of the bhikkhu or the person, even if it's a lay person, to be learned in the Dhamma. 
He doesn't say, yeah, go ahead and learn a little bit and, and then go ahead and teach. What you have are people who are, have not and are not doing the work, but they want to get to the role of a teacher. I'm surprised, I'm stunned as to this appeal that people have of becoming a teacher. Like, do they realize what it entails? <laughs> During my course of being a teacher, I've come across to, uh, to um, some, uh, maybe one or two students at the time uh, who were from the very beginning, like, when I asked them, you know, uh, they said, oh, I want to be a teacher. Well, you got it wrong. Like, why do you want to be a teacher from, like, that is a natural um, um, out, out, it grows out. It's an outcrop of a natural. Um, um, it's it's flowing from the brim, basically, of who you are, and and it becomes inevitable. But it can never be a goal. It can never be a goal. It should not be a goal. What you have is people putting the cart before the 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 you know the the wheel before the cart. What was it? Uh, the the before the animal, well the animal the ox is pulling the cart. It's not the other way around. So it's it's completely lopsided. It's completely convoluted. So if you shake today the whole internet, okay, the, if you turn it upside down and shake it, you know, like you've seen it in cartoons, most of it is going to be emptied out as to who is qualified to teach and who is not. Majority of them are not. Now, it's, it could be shocking. I'm not going to mention names, but so many of the temples and the centers, some of, some of them are like internationally known. They bring in like millions of dollars of donations come into these temples that have monasteries now. They're going to be empty. It'll be like a ghost town. Now, again, if they're helping, if they're helping their communities, if they're supporting, fine, I guess, that's on their kamma. But that is not going to mean that they are practicing or teaching the Dhamma. Hugely two different things. Now, I'm answering your question about, you know... Um, these new trends and things. But as long as we're talking about that, I also want to address how this whole movement that's been happening in, uh, uh, in, in some circles uh, of these teachers, so so-called teachers, who are now beginning to infuse, carefully though, in so many cases, uh, these elements of psychedelics. When I heard about this, and one of them actually has been teaching, in, uh, and I know him personally. Uh, personally, we've been, you know, we were fellow students uh, with one uh, teacher in the past, uh, with whom I, I, you know, I separated my way, uh, my, you know, my path from them. But I didn't realize that these individuals have stooped down so low as to include psychedelics and Dhamma together. And some of these teachers are actually at Spirit Rock and other places, you know. And they have followers. They have students. How does that fit into the Dhamma, with the Dhamma? So what I tell people, what I encourage individuals, because this is also coming to me, uh, not just from you, uh, I get emails where people are asking me these things now. You know, from Northern California, there's this movement that started, you know, beatniks or whatever, you know, all these things and crazy things that have nothing to do with the Dhamma, okay? At least with the original teachings of Lord Buddha. So what my 
encouragement is and it will always be please research the teacher and even above all research the teaching and essentially what that means is go ahead and study enough enough that means deeply by the way the life of Lord Buddha the teaching of Lord Buddha not halfway like you know way at the tail end of what this, uh, these days they call it dharma which is completely convoluted polluted a very 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 little segment of the dhamma is left in these teachings and that's why the person can blatantly come out and claim oh i'm i practice yes i study the suttas and by the way Lord Buddha did not say anything about psychedelics. What? Where, where, how, what? How? <laughs> so for me to come across these statements uh, and individuals that... Uh, but again, they have followers because, you know, if you have clowns, I mean, if you have a... a, a if you have a circus, you're going to have clowns. And vice versa. People are always... So this comes down. So if you look at it psychologically, sociologically, people uh, are highly influenced by the nourishment they get, or the lack of, in their, um, you know, family nucleus, where they grew up, how they grew up, and above all, what type of attention they received. The nourishment of um, stability, security, I call it the uh, how much has their emotional tank been filled or not. So the, the word, uh, the common word that I'm uh, referring to here is acceptability, acceptance. So many of these individuals, this ties in with what I was mentioning about teachers, so-called teachers, who, and everybody wants to be a teacher. And sometimes, as I was mentioning, people have uh, to gain authenticity. They go and, and for a week or two, temporary uh, two weeks ordination, and they come out and they use that picture. Obviously, there's going to be many, many selfies there. And they use that and they claim they even write books. Some of them are like bestsellers in the world, right? A monk, he's been a monk, yeah, and now he's a CEO or he goes and teaches CEOs on, on mindfulness. So, but, okay, narrow it down to the, to the very, like, what could be the, like, what is their goal, their target? Acceptance. And there's nothing wrong with that. Wanting to be accepted. But what is wrong with it is the means. What are you doing? And what is it that you are using? You're actually manipulating. You're manipulating to fit you're manipulating, in this case, the dhamma. You're mangling it. You're distorting it. You're destroying it, in fact. So that it could fit nicely into the ears, into the palates of those individuals from whom you are seeking acceptance. So this takes us to also power and prestige. There are several monks in the world. Some of them are still alive. From here to Australia. That do just that. They write books. They tell jokes. They have certain innuendos in their Dhamma talks. They will bend over backwards. And the first thing that's going to be sacrificed is the Dhamma. 
because the goal is not to present a pure Dhamma, but to maintain the support that they're getting. Keep those channels open. And please don't, uh, you know, like, don't, uh, don't make me lose your admiration for me. So I better make sure what I'm saying is fit, fitting what your expectations of me are, your projections. This is complete foolishness. This is complete adhamma. This is complete, well, completely opposite of what Lord Buddha did. That's why you will not find any nobility in these people. However, you you remember I was mentioning about mediocrity. When you have this world population being, for lack of a better word, mediocre, you have a mediocre class of population. That's why in the 70s and 80s and 90s, you had highly, highly educated people going and joining the cult with, let's say, what was his name, Rajnish. Highly educated, wealthy individuals who were throwing away their morality, their virtues, and behaving like, well, savages. Immoral beings. They had put away their understanding of right and wrong. So many of these people today, these... uh, younger generation, you call them uh, millennials or whatever, they are the offspring of that generation as well. Now, it's not just, you know, the 30-something or 40-something. There's also the 70-something, 70-some-year-old so-called teachers who are even now propagating psychedelics with the Dhamma, with jhana practice, for example. So anything that will still keep me on your radar of affluence and influence. But one thing's happening. It's the same atmosphere as I was mentioning with Sanjaya, Upatissa and Kolita's teacher. Because that man, he said, you both go to the Buddha, Gautama, the reckless Gautama, if you see that his teaching is a lot more, you know, Uh, in accordance with the truth than what I have been teaching you. No hard feelings, just go because I have plenty of other students, he says. You go to Reclus Gotama, he will teach the smart ones, but don't worry, I have outside many of your friends, hundreds of them, and he had over 200 students. I'm covered, basically. I'm, I'm okay, I got my support, and I... I don't, I don't need to go, he said, with you, because I want to be a teacher. So we have a lot of sanjayas today. Actually, they're not, they don't even qualify to reach that stage of sanjaya, even with his level of mediocrity. Because sanjaya knew that he was sanjaya. He knew he was a medio- mediocre teacher. Today's so-called teachers, shallow teachers, who are not based on the suttas, who are making their own versions of the Dhamma, and without the practice, without the training, without the practice, without the training, and many of them have actually mental health disorders, mind you, I know. I'm a licensed psychotherapist. (laughs) I have trained in that as well. So it saddens me deeply that people need direction, but they're copying out. They are giving up on the search. They are giving up and they're being satisfied with the very, 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 very little. It's like somebody who hears about a medication 
that is a cure for the condition that they think they have. And they write that name, that which they think they got it right. Someone said it. They don't even research it. They just heard it. They write it on a piece of paper and put it in their pocket. And they say, I am cured. That's pretty much similar to what we have today in this world of pseudo-teachers. Because Sanjaya, when Upatissa and Kolita left, the Lord Buddha, guess who went with him, with them? Almost all of the students that Sanjaya had, because once he stepped out into the veranda to look at his students down below, there was almost a handful left, five students left, for him to be called his students. But he said, well, at least I have those. He still didn't leave. So the attachment that one has, earlier I was mentioning about arrogance, comes from ignorance. But you need to have uh, the desire to maintain that ignorance. That's why it makes it arrogance. That's why it's dangerous. Why dangerous? Because the person has given up to consider the, the, the importance of urgency. This is what I tell students when they reach out asking me for something or uh, instruction or this or they want to drag me into some type of a, uh, a, a, a debate or, or uh, intellectual uh, mumbo jumbo of nonsense. What do you think about this principle? Well, that teacher said this. What do you think? I don't have time for that. I don't have. Why do you have time for that? Go outside and do your walking meditation. If you say that you've studied the Dhamma that much, if you say that you've done the jhanas, why are you sitting and talking to me? Or writing this email? Who has time to write paragraph after paragraph after paragraph of your intellectual vomit? That is endless. Endless why? Because you're not paying attention. Intention to what? Attention to the fact that you're going to die. Tomorrow morning you might not wake up. Every morning I am surprised that I wake up. Okay? I'm surprised. Why? Because it's a preparation for death. Life is a preparation for death. What that means is, how am I living my life? And if it is the Dhamma that I'm supposedly teaching, okay, how much of that is being processed by me during those waking hours? This is where Lord Buddha, if you've studied any of the Maranasati Suttas, I recently, a few months ago, maybe not that recent, but a few, several months ago, I gave the talk on the Patama and Dutiya Maranasati Suttas from the Anguttara Nikaya. And you see how Lord Buddha is urging the student to practice. And he selects two students out of several who say, yes, Bhante, we are practicing Maranasati. And he keeps asking them, how, how? So it, it narrows down all the way down to a person who says, even if I take one morsel of food in my mouth, I am contemplating the teachings of the Tathagata. And how about you, he says to another. And he says, Bhante, every time I'm breathing in, the inhalation, during that inhalation, not even like the inhalation and exhalation, just during that, because I might die, he says. That's what makes it Maranasati. So what are we talking about? Psychedelics and this and that. We've gone so far away from the Dhamma. That's why the Dhamma is dying. We are the ones who are killing it. 
when we don't live with urgency. When we live with mediocrity. The Dhamma and mediocrity don't go together. It's impossible. And no one can make the Dhamma proprietary. That means my own version. I can add things, take out things. And that's what people have been doing. I can name several of my teachers. My teachers. Who've helped me a lot. At one point or another, I had to part ways with them. Because in my studying of the Dhamma, the suttas, I saw that their lives, their methods of living and understanding and interpreting the Dhamma was not matching what Lord Buddha said. Now, this was not my conclusion. I brought this to each of my teachers' attention because I was very much living closely with them. Some of them, I, I lived with them for extended periods of time. So I saw them on a daily day-to-day day -day basis. And this is something that is highly, highly important, beneficial, but I understand it's not in everyone's ability to do or they don't have the means to do it or the opportunity, which I had. The Vimam Saka Sutta from the Majjima Nikaya is extremely important. Please go back and read that examination or investigation sutta discourse where Lord Buddha says simply because the teacher looks good, sounds good, is it looks like he's humble, he's not influenced by outside factors like wealth, uh, support, or the number of followers. Don't go ahead and make a quick decision about that, conclusion about that. Spend some time with them. Let them see, let them have the support, let them uh, just wait, wait, see until they have the support, they have the temple, they have the money coming in, the attention. Now go back and check to see if they are still humble, if they're ready to walk away from all of that. How many of these monks, how many of these teachers, monk or not, do you know that can walk away at the drop of a hat from all that that they've accumulated? If they can, wow. That's wonderful because you have now an example of somebody who matches what a true teacher is, according to Lord Buddha. Lord Buddha was that. He didn't care. He was granted entire territories by King Pasenadi, by um, Lady Visaka, by uh, Upasika, by the uh, Upasaka Anata Pindika. He was given the whole Jeta's Grove, Jeta's Park in Sarathi. He could walk away from that any moment, and he did, because he was a bhikkhu. A bhikkhu, another word for it is someone who doesn't have anything. We don't have any pockets, you know. We don't have any extra stuff to put in. <laughs> so, in that sense, it's not a glamorous lifestyle. So I don't understand why people are dying to become teachers. <laughs> But if you're not, you know, uh, if you're making up your own version of being a teacher and you're cashing all those checks, and I say this to now directing it towards these quasi, uh, you know, failed uh, monastics who failed because they leave and they make their own version of being uh, anagarika or, uh, or, or anagarika as somebody who is... Uh, who takes 10 precepts and wears white robes. But there's also the official ceremony for that. You don't just decide it and become that, you know. And you need to have a teacher who guides you. You need to take no less than 10 precepts. So I met people who weren't even taking 8 precepts, but wearing it and carrying themselves as if they're monks. Meanwhile, they're getting support left and right from people, common folk, especially in Asia, or now even the West. Because they don't know any better. They're just being you know, respectful towards what they consider to be a holy man who is anything but free lunch. You have a lot of that. And these are not Asians I'm talking about. Only you, I've seen Westerners. So 
why go through that and gather yourself some incredible amounts of bad karma? These are the individuals who don't believe in life after death, by the way. They want to squeeze their own old ideologies, philosophical, like, annihilationist view, nihilistic view, into the Dhamma, cherry-picking the Dhamma, making their own proprietary version of the Dhamma to fit their own narrative and worldview and teach accordingly. So they become their own spokespeople, spokesperson, if you will. And if you say something, anything, you're going to gra uh, dra uh, grab attention. Anything you say, you will have your own crowd showing up. And uh, depending on the times we're living in, you're, you're going to have a lot of people, if, you're, if the words that are coming out of your mouth are contentious, uh, you're saying something that's bombastic, something that's really outrageous, something that, ooh, you're shaking the establishment type of a thing. You're not the typical teacher. All of a sudden, you already are set. What is this? This is not the Dhamma. Teaching the Dhamma should be the last thing on your list. The first thing on your list should be just to shut up. Sit down and practice. Practice starts with you practicing the five precepts. Okay, if you're a lay person. I was urged to actually answer some of these questions because for a few weeks now I was taking a nice break from other than the weekly um, Sutta Exploration Series. Um, I'm in the midst of, of my traveling and so I've been enjoying my seclusion so I had to be brought out of my seclusion to address these questions because people have been asking, Bante, how come you're quiet these few days? <laughs> so... Well, it, it, as long as it's helping, sure. But there's nothing as beautiful as seclusion. Hmm. Sukiyot. So